much has been written about uh, the most accurate translation of uh, that first reading from Isaiah, that famous passage about the virgin will conceive and bear a son. Uh, in Hebrew, uh, the word is alma, which just means a, a young woman. Some translations have that. There's another specific word for virgin, so it's not saying that at the initial obvious level. And in fact, if you take it then, in that immediate historical context, the sign which was given to Ahaz, as the scholars point out, is most likely that his own wife, the young woman, would bear a son, and who did in fact become the great king Hezekiah, the great just king of Israel. And that was the sign that the Lord was giving that he was with his people, and was going to save them from their enemies. But of course, God always has a bigger picture in mind, and, and he saw something even beyond what probably the prophet himself saw, uh, that it applied to something much deeper, greater. So when you get to, the, well, the, even the Greek version, version of, of that passage, but especially the Gospel today, which obviously is Greek, uh, you have the specific word for virgin, the virgin will conceive in their son. And of course, that's what we believe in Mary, uh, it is you know, part, of our, part of our tradition. But be careful. Uh, the eminent theologian Joseph Ratzinger, who later became Benedict XVI, uh, pointed out that there was no obligation, no, no reason that the Son of God had to come to a virgin and womb to be born. Actually, there's no reason that has to be. You rightly pointed out. He could have come in the normal way and still been the Son of God. But of course, the future Pope was quick to add that nonetheless it clearly is, not only from the scriptures, but from the creed and from the earliest traditions, that Mary literally was a virgin. Um, and that's a beautiful way, as the fathers of the church pointed out, for, for God to indicate that this was really, really was a dramatic new beginning in humanity, a, a new Eve, a new Adam, as a very rich uh, symbolism. <laughs> teaches us. Hmm? Even so, as I say, we have to be careful. Hmm? Uh, because, uh, well, for one thing, uh, the uh, fathers of the church pointed out, even about Mary, even about the Virgin Mary, that the most important thing to remember is that, as St. Augustine said, Mary conceived Jesus first of all, and above all in her heart, before she did so in the womb. And without that first openness, the second couldn't have happened. That openness to receive this astounding and literally unbelievable message that she was to become the mother of God in such an <laughs> unexpected way. Uh, she was already virginally consecrated to God, so to speak, in her heart. By that, by that I mean fully dedicated to the Lord. And that she was then able to conceive in her body. As St. Bernard also says about, not only about her, but about all virgins, you know, consecrated virgins, that they better be careful because if they start getting proud and saying, oh, I'm physically a virgin, I'm so much better than all those poor slobs down there, uh, then, as Bernard, Bernard points out, such a person is lost. Because humility and love, much more important, much more important than physical virginity. You know, and if we really examine the tradition, socially and, you know, scripturally, of physical virginity, it's not a pretty picture. You know, virginity was prized in the ancient world, among the Hebrews and many other, and today, even today in some countries, you know, basically because uh, the woman is the, belongs to the father and then there's the husband's property. Uh, and by the way, Notice, please, notice how it's never a question of the male, male virginity, men's virginity. I would even measure it. And boys will be boys, and studs will be studs, and that's the way it is. Huh. Meanwhile, I have this, bur bur this uh, burden placed on women, because uh, they are the property. So, when the husband gets his new wife, he wants a new car, not a used car. Or when you get the package, you want the package not to be unwrapped yet. You want it to be 
untouched. Now, if that sounds primitive and crude and crass, it is exactly that. So that kind of nonsense, you know, is what uh, often governed, you know, the view of physical virginity. But today, in countries that you can name easily on the news, if a young woman, a very young woman, gets raped, the family rejects her because she's tainted goods, she's damaged now. Throw her out. Never mind the, the idiot who got her pregnant. Something really wrong with this. And in our own Christian tradition, our Catholic tradition, in my own order, in the female branch, in order to become a consecrated virgin in the canonical sense, up until very recently, you literally had to be a physical virgin. There's something really messed up about that. Because the important thing, the important thing is spiritual virginity as the mystics and saints have often written, as we just said about the virtues. First of all, in your heart, you have to be dedicated to the Lord. Sometimes, rarely enough, but sometimes that's expressed in a bodily way. But it's above all, and for everybody, it's primarily a matter of the Spirit coming into us, transforming us, giving us new birth, giving us new life, and new hope, about our being totally consecrated to the Lord. And that applies to every single one of us, and that's the virginity that matters. Above all. Unfortunately, if you go back to the scriptures, both Old and New Testament, you find a lot of support for this. Not so much in the Torah, but in the prophets. The writings of the prophets. You have this imagery of the Lord being the husband, wooer, the one who seeks out his people, who is the bride. You have Jerusalem described as the virgin daughter of Zion. This is all over Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea. This very beautiful, powerful image of the Lord as the bridegroom of his people. Of course, Christ is the bridegroom of the church that carries over into the New Testament as well. And you have all the imagery. Jeremiah speaks about the Exodus being the time of the wooing, the, you know, when the Lord sought out and wooed his people. It was the time of their engagement in the wilderness, when, when they got to know each other, then they lived with each other, and then, as Ezekiel and others say, Israel was faithless, prostituted herself, and the Babylonian exile, according to Isaiah, was, was the divorce. Uh, but then the return from exile, as Isaiah 54 says so beautifully, the Lord took her back, took her back, you know, as a, uh, as a uh, almost as a new bride. Uh, so that very powerful imagery is expressed there. And it applies to the people, to everybody. It's not physical, it's spiritual. It's so reminded of all of us are called to that spiritual virginity, which is a complete consecration to the Lord. Use all our powers, in whatever way is consonant with our calling in life, uh, to seek the kingdom and express our devotion to the Lord and grow in our knowledge and love of the Lord and of one another. That's what we should be focused on. That's the important thing. Scholars rightly point out that the, the passage about the Samaritan woman, remember that from John 4? It's symbolic as well. She stands for the unfaithful bride of the Lord with her five husbands, different idols that she worships. And how many idols do we worship? Money, power, fame, pleasure. Uh, and so that story is about that as well. And then another excellent example is the book of Revelation in the New Testament where it says, the Lamb will appear on Mount Zion with 144,000, symbolic again, 144,000 of the redeemed, and it says they are virgins. Physically? Well, if all the redeemed are virgins, then we're, we're, we're lost, right? No, it's spiritual. Again, these are those who have remained loyal and faithful to the Lord. That's what, it's, that's what the image means. They are the redeemed of Israel. So this is where we should put our focus. This is where our, all our attention should be. That's what's by far more important. Are we dedicated to the Lord? Do we allow the Lord, the Holy Spirit, as the second reading says, to come and make us children of God in power and the image of Jesus Christ? And if I, uh, is her spirit coming into our life you know, to transform our hearts and minds? This is, this is where our emphasis should be. Even, even in Mary's case, the spiritual openness and the spiritual virginity is much more important. In the physical virginity. So, 
we have to get away from our fixation and our fetish, and our preoccupation and our obsession with physical virginity. Socially speaking, theologically speaking, psychologically speaking, and spiritually speaking, it's really dangerous. We have to get our head on right and start putting the focus where it's required, where it really goes, where it really is important. Are we dedicating ourselves, all our powers, all our energies, in whatever way, whatever station we're called to in life, are we dedicating ourselves fully to the Lord? That's the virginity we're all called. We're all called to be virgins in that way. Fall back from whatever mistakes we've made, you know, just as Israel was from Babylonian exile. We're always called to renew our commitment to the Lord, and that's the kind of unique loyalty that we're called to express in our lives. That's what's really important.